phone? I, I, did, I don't understand what, 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 yeah, what? So let me explain this to you because it, it, I always, I see, this was a life lesson for me. And I, um, uh, out of that, I always trusted the crew because the crew has seen every joke come down the pike. You know what I mean? And so when the scenes were being played by the other two guys, there was a pay phone in the middle of the set, but nobody realized it, but the crew guy saw it. And so he said to me, like little street hustlers do, they'll check the coin return in a phone to see if somebody dropped a quarter or if they made a long distance call, maybe more change. So what I did was when I did my scene, uh, toward just before I exited, I stood next to the payphone and I stuck my finger in the coin return. And I wiggled around there to see if there's any money, I pulled out a quarter, <laughs> put it in my pocket, and then exited. And so I saw Ray Vitti about a week or so later, because we, we started knowing each other. And uh, he said, he said, Ted, <clears throat> when you checked the coin return, I knew I lost the gig. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. How did you come up with that? And I did not give the credit to the prop guy. I gave the credit to myself. I said, well, you know, I was just looking at the situation and uh, I went for it. Uh, but that's what happened. And uh, they actually gave Ray a guest appearance on the show because the producers liked Ray. But the, uh, the network or the studio, I th believe it was Columbia Pictures Television, and they were hot on me for that bit because what I did was I layered the joke. And that was the thing I learned about being a director also is how do you layer a joke? You know, how do you put in elements that not only support the punchline, but give you maybe visual uh, uh, ideas on the joke? And that was one of the things I learned. And I also, when I became a director on Love Boat, I used to, uh, I used to talk to the crew because I love the crew. And I always say, listen, if you see a joke that we're not doing, run it by me. Now, I may use it. I may not use it. But at least if you see a joke, run it by me. And I had a really good relationship with the makeup man. His name was Larry Dar. He was a big cowboy. He was about 6'3", big guy. And uh, he was the number one glamour makeup in Hollywood. But he had a really good sense of humor. And so every once in a while, Larry and I would be standing around, we'd watch the scene, and he'd say, hey, you know, Ted, if they did so-and-so, so-and-so, you think that'd be funny? And i go, wow, Larry, that's pretty good. So when I started directing, I would always say, Larry, come on the set and watch me direct the scene. And if you see anything, let me know. And so that's what we did, you know? So uh, I had a great affection for the crew uh, when I became a director. And so, some directors are full of themselves, you know? And, you know, they kind of look down because there is a caste system in Hollywood. And so sometimes they look down on the crew. But I'll tell you this, another thing is Greer Garson did our show. You know the movie star Greer Garson? Sure. Greer Garson did our show. She did a love boat and she learned everybody's names. Wow. So she would say, good morning, Mr. Wells, who was the director. Good morning, Mr. Atkins. And she'd call him Mr. You know, or uh, Miss Cavan. Good morning, Miss Cavan, if it was a hairdresser or whatever. But that was, that's old school Hollywood yep. that they, everybody counted, everybody counted. And they were gracious, not only to the other stars or celebrities that they were working with, but also to the crew. We had a, a, a we had a, a, a hairdresser named Naomi, uh, Naoma Cavan. And uh, she was Bogart's, hairdresser back in the day wow. okay so this is how we pick up i picked up some great stories naoma gave me a story that uh uh when she worked for bogart they were doing citizen kane Oof. and Bo bogart had in his contract that at 6 p.m he was going to stop now if you didn't get what you wanted before 6 p.m 
you were out of luck, okay? Because at 6 p.m., he was quitting. And to make sure that he quit at 6 p.m., Naoma's job was to come over if they were in the middle of the take, it didn't matter, whatever, come over and take the toupee off of his head. Oh my God. So they were, they were shooting Citizen Kane and the director uh, came to Naoma and said, listen, we know that Bogart has a thing about six o'clock. Listen, we need you, please. No matter where we are, if, if it's, I think we're going to be in the middle of the take at six o'clock, please don't take us to pay off. Let us finish the shot. And she said, gentlemen, you do not pay my salary. Mr. Bogart pays my salary. Wow. And in order for me to collect my check at six o'clock, I don't know what you're going to be doing. But I know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to step in there and take that to pay off. Wow. And that's what Bogart did. Bogart was really smart. He put her on his payroll, not the studio's payroll. So that whenever it, whenever anything happened at six o'clock, boom, she'd walk over and she'd take that to pay off. Okay, so she and I became really good friends. And I, and I was back, this was back in the late 70s. And sometimes they were hard on a brother. You know, the system was hard on a brother. And uh, sometimes I would get a little uh, uh, righteous and angry because I might have been insulted or, you know, uh, they might have said something out of the way or off color, no pun intended. But, you know, so sometimes I get a little hot under the collar. And Naoma saved my job on more than one occasion because she would say, uh, she would see me start to rise, okay, with getting pissed off. And she said, Ted, uh, let me fix your natural. So what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, she said, let me fix your natural. Sit down here. And she would come over and she put her hands in my head. Oh and she'd my God. start massaging my head. Bruce, that brings you down like this, man. Big time. Big time. She saved my job. <laughs> <laughs> more than one occasion, because wow. I was ready to tell some people to kiss my black ass. You know wow. what I mean? And she would say, "Ted, uh, you're natural. Let me fix your natural." Go what, 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 what? And she'd come over and she'd put those hands in my head and she'd start massaging my head. And Bruce, I would just calm down, just like that, man. Wow. Oh yeah, she was a sweetheart. She was a real sweetheart. Yeah, you know, Ted. I'm sure people want to know. Having been, having had so much experience in theater and writing, how did you, how did you get access? How did they find you for Love Boat? How did, what was the, how did they get to, how did you get to audition? I, I actually did not audition for Love Boat. I'm one of the few actors that didn't, me and Jill never auditioned because they knew us. I had done That's My Mama for ABC TV. Then I did um, another series for ABC TV called Mr. T and Tina, and that starred Pat Morita before Karate Kid. And uh, Tina was an actress named Susan Blanchard. And so this was basically, basically going to be a, a, a Japanese sitcom. Pat Morita had left Happy Days to do this series. And uh, in the process, I came in, they knew me, and I auditioned for a one-shot guest star appearance. And I was going to play the custodian of this building that Pat and Rita lived in. And I came in, did the audition, got the role. And then when we uh, went to take the thing, I scored a thousand percent. Man, I hit, I came in, did my best, boom, 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 fast exit, out of there, done. And what happened is they kind of had like a meter. And when we were doing the show, before my entrance, the laughs were like down here. And then when I came on, the laughs went up like that. And then when I left, the laughs went down. So the network noticed that. Okay, and so they get, brought me back for a second episode, a third episode, and then pretty soon I became a regular. We shot eight episodes. 
uh, before they uh, premiered the first one. Uh, anyway, they premiered the show. The show tanked, went right into the commode. And uh, but Jimmy Comack, the executive producer of that, who did Welcome Back Carter and uh, Courtship of Eddie's Fathers, shows like that, he liked me and he was going to give me a TV series centered around me. Okay, and but what, what he needed to do was to get a network to put some skin in the game. So he, they, they have a thing called a holding contract. Right. And a holding contract is they give the network gives you money or the studio gives you money, you're under contract to them, so you can't take another job. Right. And then when they get ready to use you, you know, they're paying you like a weekly salary. And then when they get ready to use you, you, you know, you you go on a different contract. Anyway, so Comac was going to develop a series around me. At the same time, the network had done their first pilot of Love Boat and they were doing a second pilot. And uh, Doug Kramer uh, and the network called me in to meet. So I went in and I met with the executive producer at that time, Doug Kramer. And basically he said, so listen, Ted, the network's uh, pretty hot on you. Uh, and they liked what you did in TNT. And I said, oh, oh, great, thank you. He said, listen, uh, do you get seasick? And I go, no, why? He says, well, we're gonna shoot this pilot on a real cruise ship and we're going to Mexico. So I just wanted to know, do you do you get seasick? No, 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 I don't get, because the actor Bruce will say anything to get of course. the job. Of course. You know, of do you course. ride a horse? Yes. Can, can you make the horse rear up? In a, yes. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Can you take a fall off of a horse? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we say anything. <laughs> do you swim? Who doesn't swim? Yeah, you know, right. Uh, so um, so that that was the interview. I didn't read any lines. I didn't uh, I didn't have a screen test or anything. They sent the script the pilot script to my agent and and my agent gave it to me. I read it. He read it. And I said to him, I said to my agent, I said, Arnie, I, I don't want to do this. He said, what do you mean you don't want to do this? I said, the guy comes in in the opening of the show. You don't see him for 15, 20 minutes. Then he serves somebody a drink in the middle of the show. And then when everybody gets off the ship, uh, he says goodbye. I said, there's nothing to do here. I said, Jimmy Comac's going to give me a series and I'll be the star of the show and da 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 da. You know, I want that. I want to have something to do. And so uh, my agent, who was smarter than I am and understood show business better than I did, said, he said, Ted, you ever you ever been to Mexico? No. He says, you ever been on a cruise anywhere? No. Has your girlfriend ever been on a cruise? No. He said, well, I want you to think of it in a different way. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, I want you to think of it like uh, they'll pay you $10,000 to hang out with them. And you only have to do three scenes and you get to see Acapulco, Puerto Vallarta, Mazatlan. You'll have time when you drop in port to go see the city that you're in. A very clever agent. Yeah, man. And I thank goodness I had that guy. Arnie Soloway, he said, so he said, just take the gig and you're, you're making some money. And then when Comac comes through, we'll jump on the thing with him. Of course. Said, oh, okay, yeah, sure. And so that's what I did. I did the second pilot. And on the second pilot, it was me, Bernie, and Fred. And um, that's who they found. They found the three of us. And I'm telling you, we had a comic uh, chemistry immediately. Wow. Wow. We were we were solid gold. You want to talk about the golden age of comedy? We were gold, wow. buddy. Now the guy that was the captain was a soap opera actor, and he um, he was nervous around comedy. He would get nervous, you know, because he could feel the joke coming, but he wasn't confident enough. And in comedy, you got to have confidence. And so he would he would always stumble, and you know, and 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 so that was it was difficult for him. So they knew they didn't have the captain, and the girl that they had as the cruise director was a girl that came from New York and doing television. She looked down upon it as you know, she was a much better talent than being on television. So they knew they needed a captain and a girl. 
anyway, they looked at the pilot and they decided to do a third pilot, which is totally, totally, totally unusual. And uh, Doug Kramer went in a partnership with Aaron Spelling. Ah. Okay. Because uh, Aaron wasn't on the second one, but he showed, uh, Doug Kramer showed Aaron the pilot. And he says, oh, yeah, okay. And so Aaron got Gavin McLeod. Aaron ah. called because Mary Tyler Moore was ending and he called up Gavin and he said, listen, uh, we'll do this, we'll do that, and da, 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 da. He made a lot of promises to Gavin. And then uh, Tweez had appeared on one of his cop shows. I think, I believe it was Starsky and Hutch. She had appeared. And so they took Tweez, they cut her hair, Candy Spelling, Aaron's wife, took her to her hairdresser, cut her hair, and she showed up the day of the filming. Wow. They didn't have a girl. They went through a whole bunch of girls up until that point. And Twee showed up the day of the filming to be the cruise director. And again, you can't buy this, but the five of us together, gold. Wow. It was gold. We liked each other. We thought each other was funny. Um, we had a good mix, you know? So, and, and it turned out really, really well. But you can't, you, there's no telling, you know, you don't have any, there's no guidelines, you know? But when it, you see it, you know, when you, when you recognize it, it's there. You know, when you see that the person has chemistry, you know, you know it's like Seinfeld. Those guys together had chemistry. And you could, you could see that they each had their own little thing, but together, they were a whole, and that's what you you wanted uh, in television. You know, Ted. I think you know now that you're saying that and this is invaluable because Love Boat is Americana like no other show, yeah. a especially uh, with all the people that got to come on the show and got a second chance of being seen by the public. But hearing you say this completely explains to me how embraced the show was why everybody wants to feel good listen a lot of people not so much anymore but people back then wanted to feel good when they watch something and watching you guys get along was yeah uh, embraceable we we want more of that because you got a girl you got a black guy you got a tall white guy you got a funny guy yeah and everybody getting along yeah. And, 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 you know, people are pretty intuitive. Yeah. When they mm -hmm. see you getting along and liking each other so well, they want more of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we stayed friends all these years. Wow. Since the last episode went down, we've all remained friends. Wow. And usually at the end of a series, that's it. You that's don't see it. the guy, you don't see the girl, you don't want to see him sometimes, you know? Wow. But with the five of us, uh, uh, well, six counting Jill, because uh, she grew up with us. She grew up learning comedy from me and Fred and Bernie, and you know? Uh, and she's a, she's a wonderful performer. But um, yeah, that the, the beauty of that is that, you know, like sometimes I don't talk to Bernie, he'll send me a book. He says, hey, Ted, reads this. Or, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll go over to his house and we'll watch the fights together on HBO or whatever, you know. And then Fred and I did a play together about uh, uh, two years ago. We did I'm Not Rappaport in Syracuse, New York. Wow. And we hadn't been together for 30 years. <laughs> and we, you know, sometimes you go, well, I don't know how this is going to work because, you know, Fred was in Congress and then he uh, was out of Congress. That's right. Doing, That's right. He was doing other things, you know. So then when we got together in Syracuse to do I'm Not Rappaport, which is about two old men, a white man and a black man sitting on a bench in Central Park, New York. And Bruce, the first line came out of his mouth. The next one came out of mine. And we dropped right back into our wow. stuff, man. Wow. It was like, wow. Because we knew, and it didn't go away. It did not go away. We stayed 
right there in on each other. And, and he's a very generous actor. I feel I'm a generous actor. So, you know, when it was his turn, I go, take it away. And then he would go, take it away, <laughs> you know? So it, it was good. And we had a big hit at this theater. It was called the Red House Theater in Syracuse, New York. We had a big, big hit. And uh, I'll never forget um, the artistic director the night before he took Fred and I out to dinner, okay? Cause he just went, Fred had done a play for this theater a year before. And he said, you should use me and Ted in Rappaport. And they went, okay, yeah, good idea. But the, uh, the guy's name is Hunter Foster. Sutton Foster is his sister. He's a big Broadway actor. He did, um, uh, what's the one about the plant eating human being, uh, uh, oh, Little yeah. Shop of Horrors. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did, he played the guy in Little Shop of Horrors and all that, Seymour Club War. Anyway, so he was now the artistic director of this theater. So he's wondering, did I make a mistake? Or, you know, is this really gonna work? Uh, so he took us out to dinner and me and Fred dropped into our, at the dinner table, we dropped into our thing, you know. Wow. And uh, I saw him and I asked him later, I said, did I see you kind of like go, okay, this is gonna work? He goes, yeah. <laughs> he goes, wow. yeah, yeah, you did. Wow. So yeah, it, it, it was fun, so. Tell me about, uh, you know, you had so many people come on board with you guys. Yeah. Uh, so many different kinds of people, the, the soap people. I mean, I, I don't even wanna, old movie stars, I, I don't even know where to even start, but who was special to you to be with, to work with, and how did they treat you, and how, how was your relationship? You know, there, there were certain people that were uh, really, really wonderful. Uh, give me an example, uh, Vincent Price. You know Vincent Oh, he's Price? terrific. Vincent Price, he told me some stuff he said, you know, in the uh, 40s, I did a show here in LA with Duke Ellington. Mm. And you're going, Vincent Price and Duke Ellington? How did that? He said, yeah, we did it down at this theater. It was called Jump for Joy and so and so, so and so. And so he gave me a little bit of Hollywood history from the black side. Hmm. Hans, Hans Conry, do you know who Hans Conry yeah, is? Yeah, sure, sure. Hans Conry was being considered for Rochester on the Jack Benny program. You would never know that. But Hans Conry said, he said, yeah, you know, cause he had a voice, this was voice acting, it was radio. He said, yeah, you know, um, I went down to audition for Jack Benny's, uh, the play, The Butler, uh, uh, Rochester. And of course uh, I was there and, so, and I see this Negro guy sitting on <laughs> you know, two chairs over and it's Eddie Anderson. Wow. And, you know, and he says, uh, so I went in and did my bit. He says, and then this guy goes in and does his bit. And he says, I didn't know who got it. And then when I listen to the radio show and I listen to his voice, I go, of course, of course, you know? <laughs> so uh, it was stuff like the, the great thing about our show is you'd get a lot of Hollywood history that you wouldn't find in the books. Uh, Vincent Price did something I always loved is Vincent, he and I then did a, a, a we did a guest appearance at an award show for the Latinos in Los Angeles. It's called the Golden Eagle Award. And he and I were sitting at the same table and he had just newly married Coral Brown. Now, I don't know if you know Coral Brown, but she's a gorgeous, elegant English lady. And he did a movie with her in England and it was a Shakespearean horror movie in which everybody died in a Shakespearean way. And he played a Shakespearean actor that was killing all these critics. And he met Coral Brown there, married her, and she came back to America with him. And But people, we were at this thing, this event, and people would come up and they say, oh, Vincent Price, I loved you and so 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 and
excuse me, but have you met my lovely wife, Coral Brown? And they would go, oh, uh, no, hello, Miss Brown, how are you? They go, but Vincent, da, da, da. And everybody that came up to his table, and they all did, they said, oh, Vincent Price, he said, excuse me, have you met my lovely wife? Coral Brown. So that's what I do now is <laughs> sometimes I'm someplace because they ignore totally ignore the wife. Yes. Vincent knew this. They totally ignore the wife. So yeah. I go, excuse me, have you met my lovely wife, Mary? <laughs> you know, and they go, oh, uh, yeah, hi, hi, Mary. How are you? you know, so th that's a habit that I picked up from Vincent Price. And I'm very pleased to tell you that, you know. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. You, I give you that. You can use that. What's your wife's name? Her name is Lauren. L O R I N. I'll use it. Use you use that. I mean, I, I, I'm not all, Vince, I'm not at Vincent Price's level, but I, I will use it. But you you know how people are. Bruce. Absolutely. You know how people are. Absolutely. Anybody? Yeah, my lovely wife. Anybody huh? else come to mind that you can think stories about and chat about? Oh, geez, there's all kinds of. You know, it's kind of like you have to say. Uh, Hey, I saw this episode where so and so. Um, I will tell you this. I'll tell you, I'll give you another good story that I like to tell. I've told this story before, but I love telling this story. Is uh, Gene Kelly came on the show singing in the rain. Wow. Gene Kelly. Oof. And um, everyone came to the regular actors and they said, listen, this guy, Gene Kelly, is kind of a grouch. Uh, he's, he's kind of cranky. So our advice is stay away from Gene Kelly, okay? If you don't have to, just wait till you're on the set and just do your scene with him because he's really kind of a cranky guy, irritable. So Bruce, I found myself, we were in Hong Kong. Oh! Yeah, we were shooting the episode in Hong Kong and I found myself on this little minivan and on the van, Everybody else was on the set and we're waiting to be called. So they're shooting another scene before our scene and I'm sitting on the bus with Gene Kelly and I look at him and I go, you know, I got a chance here to talk to Gene Kelly. Well, I don't care if he is cranky. I'm gonna go over and just at least say hi, you know? So I go and I do like this, Bruce. I go, I sit down, I go. Oh! <laughs> And Gene Kelly, Gene Kelly's like this. He's he's reading something and he looks up. He does that. And I go, Mr. Kelly, what was it like working with the Nicholas brothers? Ooh. So he goes, now you have to imagine anybody that's ever asked him anything about the movies, they start with singing in the rain. Right. So he don't want to hear singing in the rain. Right. But here is this little black actor coming over, sitting down, asking about two of the most famous black tap dancers, tap dancers in the world. Ever. And I knew that they worked together. So he he does like this. He does like this. Young man, you want to know about the Nicholas brothers? And I go, yes, sir. <laughs> and he goes, I'm going to tell you about the Nicholas Brothers. <laughs> and then he tells me a wonderful story wow. about the Nicholas Brothers working and tap dancing and how good they were and what they did together. And, blah, 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 blah. and I'm like, in heaven. Okay. So we go out, shoot our scene. Boom. We're walking off the set. He said, Hey, you want to have a drink when we get back to the hotel? Oh. Totally totally different he wasn't cranky or anything he was he was just the guy you know what i mean and so i said yeah absolutely so we go back to the hotel we change we come down to this hong kong bar in the hotel and we sit up and we drink and, and laugh and we exchange stories and stuff wow. like it was wonderful so you know i mean part of that is so you gotta you know that and and that's what it was sometimes we'd get a guest star like John Mills and his daughters, Haley and Juliet Mills. And that would be one kind of a story. We, we had uh, uh, Maurice Evans. Maurice Evans is an American Shakespearean actor. And uh, when I was in high school, we studied 
his uh, recording of Macbeth. So I got to tell him that, wow. you know. And so it, it, what it was is that you would, it, what I liked is sometimes we would uh, uh, meet someone and the guy, if the guy, uh, particularly old Hollywood, and if the guy says, I'm gonna tell you something that's not in the history books, then you knew you were in for a great ride, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something that's not in the history books. So do you know so and so on, you know, such and such and that, and D, 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 and they tell you a great Hollywood story. Uh, and so that was that was a lot of fun, yeah. So, you know, I don't want to keep you that long because we have been going at this. It's been spectacular. I'm so excited that you accepted my invitation to come on the show. But do you have a Hollywood story that nobody else would know? Mm. Do I have a Hollywood story? that no one else would know. You mean about old Hollywood or? Oh yeah, I do have one. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I'm all ears. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a great Hollywood story and it's not in the history books, okay? Beautiful, beautiful. All right, Dana Andrews, you know who Dana Andrews sure. was? He did a film called Laura, okay? With Gene Tierney. Gene Tierney was Laura and Clifton Webb, was in this movie. It was done at 20th Century Fox. It was done for Daryl Zanuck. And the guy that was producing the movie was a guy named Otto Preminger, okay? Wow. But Otto Preminger did not want to uh, produce movies. He wanted to direct movies. So he went to um, Daryl Zanuck and said, uh, listen, let me, let me direct this movie, Laura. And um, uh, Daryl Zanks, no, you're a producer. I need you to produce. You're not directing this movie. We got so-and-so, and I forget the director's name. The guy told me. He said, we got so-and-so. Danny Andrews told me what the guy's name was. And he was a stock 20th Century Fox, you know, crime director. He says, no, 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 this is a crime thing. And we got so-and-so. He's going to direct it. So what Otto Preminger did was he waited, he scheduled the movie when he knew Daryl Zanuck had to go to Europe on business, okay? So Daryl Zanuck leaves to go uh, to Europe. They start shooting Laura. And the guy's shooting it like a crime story because it is a crime story. And uh, Preminger goes to the director and says, hey, that's not what Zanuck wants. He said, what are you talking about? This is a, a old gumshoe cop that you know, falls in love with the painting. He says, no, 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 no. He wants, he wants it to be more of a romanticized guy who loves the picture, not some old gumshoe guy, not some old crusty cop. And so he says, no, no, that's not. He says, yes, I'm telling you. You're going to argue with the boss? So he starts changing his direction on Dana Andrews. And Dana says, I got concerned because I, I went to the director. I said, isn't this a old crusty cop? This? And the guy goes, no, that's not what Zanuck wants. He wants a more romantic thing. And dun, 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 dun. So they shoot a week. Zanuck comes back. <laughs> He looks at the dailies and he goes, what the hell is going on? What are you guys doing? So he calls in Preminger, he says, Otto, what the hell's going on here? This guy's an old crusty cop. And he says, I know, I tried to tell the director, but he, well, he has this other thing. You know, I really think you should let me direct this because this guy doesn't get this. And so he calls in everybody, Dana Andrews, Clifton, Gene, Tyranny, everybody calls them all in. And he says, you guys are making the wrong picture. Wow. He says, and he points to the director, you're fired. And he turns to, he says, ladies, Otto is gonna direct this picture because he understands what I'm talking about. And so Dana says, no one spoke up, but everyone realized that Otto Preminger had manipulated this situation. 
And that's a story you won't find in any history books. I'm gonna have and to that's how he it. got to be a director. I'm going to have to go look for this movie now. Laura, yes, look for it. And the thing is, this, this is what Dana Andrews says. And I said, well, why, you know, why do you think he was so successful? He says, all you had to do was film what the script said. If you filmed what the script said, because it was a flawless script, he says, you just do that and you were good. But the other guy was going against it, but he's going against it on the recommendation of Preminger because Preminger wanted to be a director. He said, but he said he couldn't, he said Preminger couldn't fail. He said, and you look back over Preminger's movies, you'll see that's the best one he ever directed. Because wow. the other scripts he got, we're nowhere near as succinct as that Laura script. Wow, that's great. So, wow, man, wow, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. So hey, that's that's the kind of stories we got. I appreciate that. Is there one thing, looking back, that you would have done? Th my last question. Tough to let tough to let you go. Is there one thing you would have done differently, or is there some place where you made a left where you, oh, I should have made a right in your career? Um. You know, sometimes you have to go with the flow, okay? I was offered, uh, you remember they did Roots? Yep. And Roots went right through the roof. Yep. Okay? Then, then they did Roots 2. And I was offered to play Alex Haley's daddy in Roots 2. And we agreed to it. Okay, and I was going to do Roots too, but we had to get permission from Aaron Spelling. Now, at the time, I was being um, short stopped on Love Boat. In other words, they weren't giving me my deal, they weren't letting me fully flesh out the character. And so we went to Aaron Spelling and said, Look, you're not letting Ted. Uh, flesh out the character. He's got this shot to do Roots. Roots was the number one show on ABC TV. We want your permission to do Roots. And he goes, what do you mean they're not letting Ted uh, do his thing? And so he called a meeting and Gavin McLeod had some issues with some of the scripts. And I had issues with the fact that I wasn't a part of the show. I wasn't fully integrated into the show. And so he brought the writer in that was leading the writing room. And, and he said, look, here's a problem. How do we solve it? And the guy said, well, we can do this, this, and that. And he says, okay, here's a problem with Ted. How do we solve that? So, well, we can do this, 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 and that. And so they solved the problems. Now, had I done Roots, I think more doors would have opened up. But by the same token, I was able to solidify my position on Lubbock. So it was really nothing I could do because Spelling had a habit of not letting anyone work outside of what he called his family. Right. And I had a shot at working outside of the family, but there's no, you know, uh, 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 I would, I think when I, came back to the show, I would have been relegated to a smaller piece of the pie as far as, you know, characterization and being a part of the the cake, the whole, the pie, the thing, you know? And so, yes, I mean, I, I would have done that differently, but I couldn't do that differently. You know what I mean? So that's, and, and Roots uh, Hollywood wise is a, a part of Hollywood historical you know, I mean, that's a big, big deal in Hollywood folklore, uh, but it wasn't possible. So I'm not, I wish I could have done it. I couldn't do it, but I'm not regretting the choice that I made to right. flesh out who I was going to, who you were going to be seeing me do every week. Right. You know, I was happy with that. And, and how many years and how many episodes? I mean, goodness gracious. Yeah, 200 something episodes, 10 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. At a time when, uh, you know, they the shows weren't running that long, you know. Now it's kind of changed where you had like, you know, some other shows that have run 
you know, uh, the, what is it? Grey's Anatomy is going on and on and on, you know. But back then, it was a really, uh, uh, most shows went either five or seven. So us going 10 was uh, really a good deal. And you were so recognizable. I'm sure people stopped you on the street all the time. All over the world. Oh. All over the world. We could go, I could be walking out. I, I, when I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, it was in the middle of Love Boat and uh, I was studying Shakespeare there and then I met this little girl and I took a little English girl I took her out she was gorgeous little girl and I took her out to dinner and we were talking and stuff and while we were having dinner people would come up to the table and you know usually maybe American tourists not so much you know or somebody from somewhere else other than England and and then and the girl looked she says you're famous and i said well in america i'm famous obviously you don't know who i am so i'm not that famous but everybody that had come on she says well i'm not used to people uh showering attentions on the my date i'm used to them showering attentions on the me <laughs> and i said oh she says yeah i got i'm making an, a, a big adjustment here because uh People want to talk to you instead of guys coming over wanting to talk to me, you know? So I said, oh, that was cute. Yeah, and that was you cute. had such a great attitude. You know, people just loved you and embraced you. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that nine out of 10 people that approached you on the street had nothing but big positive hellos. And oh, yeah, yeah. And, and particularly uh, Black folks, because at that time, you know, we didn't have a lot of images on wow. television and particularly you know i was i was a romantic lead i would fall in love every other week on the show you <laughs> know so we didn't have a lot of that i mean you had ron glass yeah. on um barney barney miller but he wasn't a romantic he was a cop and that, that's another you know okay it's another cop show and you had uh, uh bob guillaume who again it wasn't so much about romance as it was well, about the comedy yeah you know, so uh, oh, I was Ted. fortunate. So people, people liked the character that I played. Wow! And so I was, I was very fortunate in in that. Is when you walk into a room and people recognize you and they smile just that much, just as opposed to going, "Oh, it's that." You know, it wasn't. Oh, it's that guy. It's go, "Hey, it's you." You know, yeah, that's a really nice thing. Wow. Yeah. Well, I am so happy that we spent this time together and you've enriched my life just by spending this time with me. And, oh, thank you, Bruce. And I hope that eventually tens of thousands of people, uh, especially in with black actors and singers and dancers, they're gonna learn so much from this show, from you, that I can't imagine them hearing this anyplace else. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And I hope I appreciate we stay, you. stay in touch. And when your book okay. comes out, I want to do whatever I can to uh, help get the word out with that. Okay. Thank you so much. Ted, God bless. Thank you so much. The 80s golden age of comedy, it just doesn't get any better than sitting here with Ted Lynch. Thank you. God bless. And we'll see you all again. Bye-bye.